Hello everyone, welcome once again to Artificial Intelligence. As always, I'm Bart Massey. As always, I sincerely hope you're staying safe and well out there in these difficult times. Today I want to talk to you about something that's actually really fun, which is local search. It's a technique that is astoundingly good on a wide variety of state space search problems, given that it meets your needs. It doesn't meet all needs, but for a lot of needs. It's just the ticket and has been something of a revolution as it's been explored in constraint satisfaction problems, in other kinds of problems as well. It's a fun technique. So let's take a look at it. And if you remember back a little bit, you know, we've got all these fancy complete searches, depth first searches and breadth first searches, and they all take a ton of memory for stop lists and stuff on our sliding tile puzzles. They are fiddly to implement, just seem hard. And you know, if you think back to a little while ago, we were playing with random walks, just randomly moving the pieces around to solve sliding tile puzzles. Let me remind you of how that worked out. So if we say, um, this is our thing, and if we say python3 slider.py, uh, let's, let's look at this one first and see what the difficulty is, hard3.p, and we will use uh, minus s bfs. Let's time this and see how long it runs. This one I chose because it has a particularly long solution length to get everything in place for whatever reason. But after eight seconds or so, it should finish out. You know, the breadth for a search is pretty expensive and it's pretty memory intensive. And there we are, 12 seconds this time. Not sure why it ran faster earlier. Maybe because I have other stuff running. So great, we know there's a 28 solution to this, but as we saw, we don't have anything that does a fantastic job. A star does okay on four by four puzzles. And if you'll remember when we used just a random solver, very fast, gives you garbage quality of solution, but very fast. We can improve the solution quality a little bit by trying to avoid places we've already been. That slows it down a bit, but oh, in this case it didn't give us because it's randomized better solution quality, but sometimes it does. So, you know, these things are fast, but they don't produce very good answers, and they aren't that fast. What we'd really like is something that would be blindingly fast. And so what we're gonna do is think a little bit about why a random walk doesn't work very well, right? Which is that sort of, as I'm moving around in here, right, if I just click things around randomly, there's no measure of making progress. And if I avoid going back to where I was, I can at least avoid this kind of nonsense, but I still, you know, I have to wait potentially forever. Well, the obvious thing to do is to try to move tiles always more into position. And right here, we see a situation where that's already a problem because there's only two things I can move and neither one of them I can make be closer. This gets more out of position maybe. Maybe maybe 13's equally out of position, so I at least can do that. But you notice there's a lot of ties in these things. Now 14 would have to move away from its target position. Uh, 10 could move down, I guess, and then I can, don't want to move seven because it's already in position. I don't want to move 11. I can move 11. I can move, three is already in position. I don't want to move 11 back. I've got stuck in what's called a local minimum. And so there's a lot of getting stuck in local minima. What do I do? I break the tie. Let's say I break it randomly and get lucky and I move the three. Well, now I still don't have anything that helps except moving the three back, right? Uh, moving the seven out of position doesn't work. Moving the one to the right doesn't work. And so I can't just, you know, these puzzles are harder than that. I can't just greedily walk toward a solution because I'm gonna end up with ties, I'm gonna end up with plateaus. 
And so I'm gonna to wanna to find some tricks for moving around in this tile space in directions that lead me in the general direction of where I wanna go, but without losing that randomness. Why do I wanna walk randomly? Well, one of the reasons is it's very fast. I don't have to do any computation, any thought. I can just make moves. The heuristic here is pretty fast to compute. And so I can make a lot of moves per second doing this. And so it's likely to be pretty quick. So maybe we just wanna use our heuristic to guide the walk, but we wanna get not stuck in local minima. And so one possibility is to mix it up a bit. And this was sort of the thing that turned this viable back when people were first thinking about random walks as a solution strategy. We might wanna sometimes make random moves. And when you're stuck, sure you wanna make a random move, but maybe it's good to make random moves all the time. Maybe I should generally try to move things toward where they go, but maybe sometimes I should just make a random move or two random moves or three random moves without even thinking about it and then try to put things back where they go. So the five here, for example, would come up if I happen to do a greedy move this time and the four could go to the right but now I'm kind of stuck, but maybe I get luck. Maybe I just make a random move and I move the four back. I don't know. Maybe sort of guiding things like that. And it turns out that sort of a 50-50 mix probably is as good as anything of this. So half the time we'll make a random move. Half the time we'll make a move that goes in the right direction if there is one. Some move that's, you know, best of the choices we have. And maybe if we do that, we'll keep things jiggling around enough that things will tend toward their correct position over time. The other thing we can say about that is that maybe if they don't jiggle into place over time, over a long period of time, uh, we should go back to our original configuration. That's not easy to do in a sliding tile puzzle, but we can do it sort of notionally. Go back to our initial configuration or pick a new random configuration as far as that goes, shuffle it up, and then try again. So maybe we should just restart every once in a while and try the search from scratch. Because sometimes it's gonna take a long time, sometimes it's not gonna take so long. Maybe if we restart it, we'll get lucky and get a good one. So for satisfiability, the CSP we talked about last time, this is a technique that's used quite a lot. Uh, this is WalkSat and is due to, uh, oh, I'm spacing his name. You can ask me later. But a uh, famous computer scientist and is a really, really nice technique for that. It's a nice technique for puzzles, it's nice for a lot of things. Notice that it has a problem, right? It's not a complete method, right? If the puzzle really is unsolvable, if somebody swapped the tiles, just like our dumb random methods, this won't ever find a solution. It won't ever be able to tell you there isn't one. And in fact, it may get really close. It's really possible that it'll get down to where the two tiles are swapped at the end and then try to fix that by making random moves and heuristic moves and every so often it'll get to where the two tiles are swapped at the end and everything else is in place. And it doesn't have any way to notice that the puzzle's unsat. And so that's one downside of this method. It's is that you won't, it can't report unsat. You can just wait until you're done. But you know, that's a funny downside because the complete methods are the exact same way. On a large problem that's unsat, those things never finish anyhow. And so even though in principle, if you were able to wait arbitrarily long, you would eventually find out some puzzle was unsat. In practice, nobody waits arbitrarily long. So maybe that's not such a bad drawback. The other drawback, of course, is optimality. I'm still gonna get long paths. So what do we use for sliding tile puzzle search? I can get total tile distance, or I, you know, we talked about Manhattan distance, total Manhattan distance from the goal. We can just look at how many tiles are out of place. And so we have a heuristic <clears throat> to try to place things. And we can just put together a little implementation and try these techniques out. And so I've implemented this. This is, again, I won't show you the code, we'll show it to you in class later, but uh, this is an implementation of 
of this heuristic local search on this hard problem. Oh, oh, 0.05 seconds. What if I try it on a problem of size four, like the ones that we were having trouble with? Oh, half a second. Then notice that it's visited 18,000 states. This time it only visited 2051 states. So, you know, it depends a lot how lucky you get, but 2051 moves is still a lot of moves for a human to execute. And you might think about the obvious thing, which is once you've found a solution, maybe you can optimize that solution. You can walk over it somehow and get rid of moves you didn't need and make it better. Or you can do this game of, well, let's just keep trying it and see what we get. There's a 1775. Ooh, that one took 36,000, long enough that it actually, we actually noticed it waiting. Point is, it's pretty fast. It's a pretty fast way to solve these puzzles. And again, you know, it works partly because we know the puzzle is solvable when we do it. And if you'll remember, the only other thing we had for this was A star, which will produce a shortest solution. But we're going to be waiting a while, longer than we probably want to sit here for that to come back. So the last thing, I'm going to try to close out sort of our sliding tile puzzle adventures at this point. I think we've seen most of what's to be seen there. But you notice that there's a fairly short algorithm you can get by sort of moving each tile into place in turn, and it gives reasonable solution lengths. And there's sort of, you learn that at the end, there's some little tricky bits. And so you learn sort of rotation macros to make that possible. So if I go to a three by three puzzle here, because I really don't want to, I really don't want to, uh, Yeah, go away. I just want to go back to the three by threes. I don't know how to do that. Um, so if I go to a three by three puzzle here, we've talked about this before, right? I'm going to put the one tile in place and then the two tile in place. And then the three tile in place. But now see, it's hard to see how to put the three tile in place. So we start to learn some strategies. We start to learn some tricks for getting it there. So in this case, I can do that and then do this. And now I've got the first row in place. And so when you get stuck like that, what humans tend to do is learn these macros, learn these tricks for getting things out. Like here, I can see that I can rotate this over to here. So I'll do a rotation macro that I've memorized. And if you look at how people solve, say, Rubik's Cube, that's all about that. See, now I can rotate the five up to here. And the six now, I can't really rotate, but I can rotate it around like that. And look at that. So the point is the humans do better, but the humans do better by learning some tricks and they still can't prove the optimality. Was that thing I just did the shortest solution to that sliding tile puzzle? Right, humans are bad at that. And it's easy to program this if I gave you as an assignment, which I'm definitely not, you know, write a program that solves sliding tile puzzles by the human method, I say easy. It would probably be a day of work uh, to sort of get all the cases right and make sure that it can solve all the puzzles and doesn't get stuck in some weird situation. You'd have to think about it and figure it out, but it's certainly doable. It's certainly not what you'd call a epic technical challenge. But you'd really like not to have to do that work and you'd really like the computer to figure it out. Can say a machine learner learn how to solve sliding tile puzzles? I don't know, probably, but it's a very different kind of approach that you know we could talk about again later in the course. Now local search, like I say, isn't just for sliding tile puzzles, it's for a lot of things. And for three sat, it works really quite nicely as well. You uh, remember from last lecture, we talked about three satisfiability where you have some CNF formula with three clauses in it and you want to assign the variables. Well, here the state space gets to be a little different. Instead of thinking about the space in 
Complete search, we started with the space of partial assignments. Here we're gonna work in a state space where everything's always assigned, and we'll start by just randomly assigning them. And that means a whole bunch of clauses will be unset. And our goal now is gonna be a heuristic that tries to make more of the clauses satisfied by changing the value of some variable to true or false. So if I look at all the variables, I can find one that flipping it makes a whole bunch more clauses true, net, and that's what I'll try. That's the greedy move. And then I can use noise moves and restarts just like I did with sliding, sliding tile puzzles. It turns out that a lot of times that is a very, very efficient way to solve three set problems when they're satisfiable. So that's local search. It's a really cool tool. You should read about it, think about it, and add it to your toolbox because a lot of times it can find a solution where these complete methods that in principle are very nice just can't. The power of randomness is apparently real. So that's what I've got to tell you today. Again, please stay safe and well in these difficult times. Thank you very much for listening, and I look forward to talking to you again real soon.